welcome everyone to today uh thanks everyone for being here it's so wonderful to have the opportunity to be on this call with two other primatologists who i respect and whose work i really enjoy and um, whose work i followed for a while as well and to just get together and talk about how incredible it is to have the opportunity to lead a career in primatology and what that actually means and hopefully we can tell you more about it as we go along so uh for those of you who are joining in a uh, cws webinar for the first time uh the wildlife chronicle series first started uh, during the pandemic we used to have some public talks in the office and uh, over time we wanted to keep doing these things uh but of course couldn't so we went online and started using zoom and we found out that we could reach out to so many more of you and ever since we've done 50 webinars and on a whole bunch of topics so if you'd like to check out any of the past webinars just head over to our youtube channel and it's all there and um, the recording of this one will be up there in a day or two as well so you can always uh, share it with others who you think might be interested if they weren't able to join today so thanks so much for being here today and uh, being part of our 50th webinar which is uh, which is really cool um and uh, today we have with us uh, shrijata who is currently a postdoc and uh, she works extensively on uh, developmental psychology she works on gestural communications ethology she's studying how empathy has emerged in human and non-human primates just a whole bunch of fascinating stuff and we're of course going to unpack all of that today so welcome shrijata i'm so so glad that you're here thanks for joining us thank you for for having me and uh, yeah uh, it's a pleasure as i was telling you thank you thank you and then we also have shikha who happens to be my phd batchmate at the center for wildlife studies and both of us have each other in the office uh, to discuss monkey business all the time and uh, it's wonderful to have developed uh, projects alongside shikha and watch the incredible work that she's doing as well she works with lion tail macaques in the western ghats of india and she's studying their movement ecology and how they navigate a lot of the landscapes they're currently a part of and how they're changing so welcome shikha it's so exciting to have you here too thanks shikha it's always a pleasure talking to you about monkeys <laughs> um so we are let's just jump right in and i wanted to know if do, do you remember the very first time you interacted with a monkey in your life uh, of course i mean outside of the realm of science or academia in any way but just in your life what do you remember the first time you saw a monkey or interacted with one shikha would you like to go first um not the very first time actually i mean uh, the place where i grew in uh, uh, the village where i spent my childhood in uh there would always be like a one or two troops of bonnet macaques frequently visiting that area so that memory i do have but not the exact very first interaction or the fascination for monkeys so back then i feel like it wasn't very intentional i in general i enjoyed watching wildlife so um it was one of the species that i enjoyed watching but uh, again it's very different from how i view primates monkeys right now versus how i view it as a kid <laughs> yeah that's bonnets are such a fun first species to to have come across what about you shrijata well i mean i i don't really remember the first time i saw a monkey uh, but having like grown up in the outskirts of calcutta uh, my because of my father's job we moved around a lot in the in the village areas in the rural areas of bengal uh, i've been exposed to the langurs uh, we would in these areas and i've seen that how uh, people were quite scared of them because of the negative aspects of the conflict because they were raiding the fields etc and i had been protected by the adults whenever there would be monkeys in the area um however my mom actually told me a very funny story which was from her uh, paternal um grandmother's place 
But when her grandmother was a new, a newlywed bride, she came to this rural area. She was generally from a, a more um, uh, urban area. She came to this rural area, and the first time she saw troops of langurs every day visiting um, visiting the garden and the orchards. And one day there was a fight between the troops, apparently two troops, and apparently a langur mother. She was carrying a tiny baby. She came to my mom's grandmother, put the baby in the grandmother's lap, went on fighting, resolved the fight, and came back to pick her pick her um, infant up from. And my my mom's grandmother was so flabbergasted; she didn't know what to do. She was just sitting holding a langur baby. And ever since I had heard this story, I was fascinated. Like, why why are we sad about them? Because they are behaving like exactly what how a human mother would behave. That if she had to go for a fight, she would rather keep her baby safe with another another individual who is not involved in the fight so i grew up with these kinds of stories and and you know folklores and uh, monkeys exist uh, very predominantly in indian well indian folklore of course but also bengali folklore first time i was surrounded by monkeys was when i started uh, doing my masters in the forest research institute in dehradun so we would have lots of troops in the campus and also in the wildlife institute of india campus and I remember I used to just stand and watch them. Definitely, I was not introduced to animal behavior methods at that point of time, but I was just fascinated by their behavior and how very human-like, well, don't quote me on this. I'm not going into the anthropomorphism debate yet. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it picked my interest. Uh, but then uh, career-wise, I went on to study other animal species. And finally, eventually, I came to Bangalore. I was at one of Rana's talks. And that was the moment I knew that I had to work with monkeys. You know, you know how inspiring his talks could be for those of you who know Rana. And that's how my monkey business began. I started uh, observing them uh, informally in the GKVK campus and in the ISC campus. Yeah. So and then I realized that, OK, fine. <laughs> this is something to be pursued. Oh, that's such a beautiful story, though. I I really wish that was something that could have been visually documented or something that we could have been witness to. That just sounds I fantastic. Know. I know. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's so interesting to know that it was a talk that was that turning point for you that said, okay, this is what I want to look at and continue watching. What mm -hmm. was it? For you, Shikha, do you remember any particular milestone or moment? Was there a turning point where you said, yes, I want to work with monkeys? Uh, for me, like I said, it was quite intentional getting into primatology. Um, I was more interested in large mammals uh, from the beginning, but not specifically into primatology. And uh, during my first, uh, while I was looking for fieldwork opportunities, I got happened to like... Uh, be part of a project which was working on uh, to look at clientele macaques distribution. Um, so that's when I was introduced to uh, the world of primatology. Maybe. And uh, again, a, during a part of that project, while I got interested and I read more about the species, their behavior and so on, there was a particular time period when I was able to like spend quite a bit of my time just watching one troop. Uh, just spending my days with the troop, following the troop, and just observing what they were doing. So I think that was uh, more of a turning point for me than my experiences as a kid or uh, observing that species. So that one event was very fascinating where I just spent my days like doing just nothing else but just observing them. And um, like before we got on the call, it was not like actually data collection or anything, but just spending the days watching them going on about doing that business, um, uh, how the social, the system works, how the individuals jump from maybe like even like subtle things like how they hold the branches or jumping from one branch to the other, how the interaction happens. Uh, I, I think I got hooked on to from that moment and then there was no looking back to any other species then to study. Yeah. So tell us a bit more about which species this was and what your first very first project was uh, Shikha because I fully relate to what you were saying I think uh, even though maybe I was a bit more sure about primates initially it was that first experience in the field that I was like yep right decision <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, my first work was uh, on lion tail macaques I still am doing work on lion tail macaques itself so my first project was again in Silent Valley National Park in Kerala 
Um, so it was looking at the distribution, the population distribution in within the national park. And so my initial work was to walk in transects and to just uh, see if I can spot the species, but not really spend time with them. But over time, like uh, like I mentioned, I got an opportunity just to do a behavior work and I spent my days with them. And that was uh, very fascinating for me. Again, uh, I can relate to something that Srijata also mentioned uh, while she was like introducing how, like, how her childhood experience was. Uh, like I mentioned, how I look at the macaques or even the primates now is very different from my experience as a kid. So even then, I remember that uh, if there is a troop visiting our the, the around my house, then my parents or relatives or whoever is around me would hold my hands probably and say that don't go like near them. They might like attack you. Um, or even they would sort of like mimic the macaque behavior and mock them or that kind of, that is what I remember as a kid. But this experience sort of like changed how I view because uh, how I view primates itself because I got to like spend time in the forest, very close probably with a troop and they were just going on about their daily activities and that was so different from what I had experienced in my childhood. And I knew that, okay, this is how they actually behave. It's, they are not uh, dangerous or uh, some species that need to be like stayed away from or someone like there needs to be adult supervision if um, they are close by. So that perspective as well sort of like worked for me really well and to observe them in their natural habitat um, in the forest, Western Ghats, the rainforest is, I'm, I'm very biased towards the rainforest uh, in, in, and Western Ghats. So watching them in, in, in those forests, um, just the background as well as the species moving about sort of like got me hooked into the species. Yeah, It's not a particular moment over there, just that entire experience of getting to like watch them very close and knowing that every day is very different. Um, and it keeps changing and that, uh, you know, that um, that fascination to know more and to maybe like uh, see, okay, what is going to happen next? This interaction happened, what is going to happen next with this individual? So uh, that, yeah, that sort of whole experience like, made me want to like work on lion tail macaques more. Yeah, it's like watching a thriller series. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and tomorrow, okay, I have to come and follow up. Yeah, yeah I completely relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so true. So much drama unfolds every day, especially if you pay close attention to what's going on. Um, so, Srijata, tell us more about the macaques that you were observing in Bangalore because uh, clearly, even though it was a different species, you were looking at bonnet macaques and you were in an urban setting, which I guess at that time was also not as urban as it is right now. It was probably semi-urban, uh, but you clearly relate to what Shikha is saying and her experiences from a rainforest. So, what was it like in Bangalore for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... You well, GKVK campus and ISC campus, I wouldn't rather consider them as very urban because you know where they are, like in front of the old CES building or inside GKVK. It's quite away from, say, traffic interventions or too many people. But of course, bonnet macaques, they were they had a tendency to move more towards the canteen areas or where people were feeding them. Well, I was not doing any systematic study in the in the urban areas because it was more for me to understand how to do primatology. So I would take notes from Rana and then there was Muyuk at that point of time, who was also Rana's former PhD student, who used to help me a lot just to identify the behaviors, etc. So for me, it was more of me getting used to the monkeys and habituating myself to the field. However, um, there were there were a few ex experiences which, um, how do I put it? It's like, I, in theory, I knew that what were the conflicts, what were the reasons and underlying causes or initiations of, of negative effects of human primate interactions. But there I got a hands-on experience. So for example, at the GKVK canteen, every morning, so I would start like at around six o'clock, around seven o'clock, there would be this person who came with a box of sweets uh, to feed the, the bonnets. And, and after a couple of days, I approached him very politely, told him that why this should not be. And, you know, I was also young. I also had a very rosy view of the world. I thought that if I talk to people, things will change. 
So I just approached him to tell him that, hey, this is what you're doing. It's not very good for the macaques. I know you're doing with a good intention, etc. He just looked at me and he said, that, well, I'm feeding them because they are God. They're, they're, they're the monkey God. And I said, no, that's not the case, da, da, da. And then he just looked at me and he said that, hey, shut up. Because if I feed them, they're going to bless my family and it's good for my family. I don't care whether it's bad for them. You know, and that was a blow. And I was like, okay, fine. I see that there is a huge difference in the worldviews. And he, from his, his point of view, is okay. But he has his logic. And I don't, I didn't know how to, you know, start a dialogue or where to go with it, which was not the point of my research either. So these were the little experiences that I saw. And then when I saw the monkeys in Mysore, uh, when I went to Nandi Hills, um, the... And even in Bandipur, where I was doing uh, my fieldwork for my PhD in the canteen areas, these were monkeys which were moving to other parts of the more forested areas during the day. But during exactly the time when the tourist vehicles arrived, they would come to the to the um, canteen area, and I would see a whole different range of interactions. Some had very friendly strategies of begging and you know going and very nicely asked requesting for food but others had more aggressive uh, strategies so by and by i saw the individual differences the flexibility these monkeys had um and the flexibility that humans had because it was not always very aggressive uh, behavior from the humans part there was a lot of understanding they wanted local people you know these are not people who have been exposed to the field of primatology or the theories of primatology, but through their own experiences, daily experiences, I learned a lot from the local people. Like they used to tell me that this is a monkey who would come every day, ask for one banana. If I give him one banana, he would not bother me. So I don't care. I give him one banana, you know, and they knew the different individuals and that one will always come for more bananas. So I don't give them more bananas. So they, the humans were also co-opting with the system and seeing that how to reduce conflict that was there without any intervention from experts. They already, already tried to. And of course there were, there were times where things went out of hand when the monkeys were raiding the field and that got nasty, but generally day-to-day -day life, there was a lot of understanding. There was a lot of, intention to understand what was going on in their own ways from both the from both the non-human primate and the primate's point of view to try to mitigate and coexist which we have been doing forever in in india right we have been coexisting with wild species forever and now it's just going out of hands because of you know better than i do that for, for what reasons yeah so um initially those were those were kind of practical experiences trying to match with the theoretical experiences, what I have learned or heard from other people and experts and finding my own under understanding, um, trying to look at that, no, this is not a black and white story. There are so, so much gray areas that it's very, very difficult to address, Well, which is why it should be addressed, but by and by. <laughs> yeah. No, but thanks for bringing that out because I think especially in places uh, around India, you if you're looking at non-human primate behavior, you end up looking at human behavior as well, right? Because they are so closely linked together and they relate to each other and they end up adjusting and adapting to one another in such interesting ways that at some point you just can't disentangle the two. Um, yeah, I'm just so fascinated by even some of the quotes that you just shared with us in terms of the reasoning for why people chose to feed monkeys. And it's so incredible how everybody has their own reasons and logic for why they do it. Um, so I also wanted to ask uh, both of you, since even before we began the webinar, we were discussing how unlike a lot of other taxa in wildlife and when you're looking at many other kinds of species for behavior, you always have to use these proxies. You have to set up cameras, you have to use um, other parallels, you have to um, look at signs to figure out if they've been there or not, what they might have been up to. But with primates, you know, they're a kind of kind taxa where they allow you to over time follow them, spend time amidst them and actually get those really one-on-one -on -one close observations, which is so incredible. Um, 
and i'm sure both of you have tons of anecdotes and special observations and memories from your field work that you've tucked away in your mind so could you share a couple of those observations or any special days that you remember from just the fact that you could observe them so closely and spend full days in their presence watching them minute by minute um shikha would you like to go first sure uh okay this is quite a lot though because yeah the feel experience is like we both of us said and you of course know like all days are so different the behaviors like so different what they do is so different so it's a lot of memories and observations that we have uh but i think one of the most special and i think i have mentioned it to you and maybe like whoever asked me is when i'm finally able to like habituate them so even if it's a troop that i have been like observing um uh, in the in the previous year or something that we do always like give them a habituation period where it's just following them around and letting them know that we are not a threat to them and it's i feel like it's sort of like asking them permission to like let us be with you and just like observe them and i have very clear memories of each time that i have habituated them i then know that they have sort of like gotten habituated so i have like clear memories of each time that has happened and how the troop behavior has like shifted for example in my very first field uh, season when i was like following the troop for the very first time um i remember that the adult males were the one who were okay to my presence first they were sort of like curious and uh, look at you uh, while the other individuals might like start moving ahead especially the a female with an infant if it's there they would hide behind the vegetation and not show me the baby sometimes or just like move much ahead uh but over time maybe it takes like a week or two or maybe like a month or more depending on where or how habituated the troop is to like human presence uh but that change i felt like a very i mean not very clearly but over the days you would sense that they are okay with you being around them and they would let you uh follow them not run away so fast like other like the first day or so um even uh maybe like during another field season one memory i have is when we the troop was moving very fast through the days it's been like a month probably like of them of us like trying to like uh habituate them and uh, one day we just like sat for lunch and we just like opened our dabbas and we just sat there thinking okay they might like move slowly or we might be able to like find them after our lunch break and uh, we saw them like just hanging around there and not moving it sort of like maybe felt like they were waiting for us i don't know it's just what we think but they were just there and maybe the juveniles were like quite uh, curious of us what we were doing and just like stopped a little bit so these kind of things did happen in field and this is it feels very magical to me that finally they are sort of like accepting us in like or they don't perceive us as a threat probably and they just let us be and they also know that we won't harm them and they also like go about doing their own business it's not that they are also like looking at us all the time and watching us but they just do whatever they are doing and also like let us observe them uh and sort of be part of their environment probably so it's the magical moment for me always every field season that moment when they are finally like habituated or maybe they habituate us whatever that is yeah but that moment is quite magical yeah i really love that you said that that was uh that's probably the time period where we're asking for their permission to follow them i think that's such a beautiful way of looking at it and uh, and i really hope you're right i hope that it's not just that they are used to us so that they've like oh, okay fine it's this person again but that they are actually actively giving us permission um i think that's a very uh, really lovely way of uh, of looking at it yeah uh, why i feel it magical is also it's a trust building process mm -hmm. and it takes some time to like build that as well so it it i feel like very privileged that they are trusting us to be around them as well so yeah Definitely. yeah getting goosebumps thinking about <laughs> monkeys trusting us <laughs> shrijita what about you any any special stories or memories you have Well it's a very it's a very tricky question to ask me if I start talking about it I will not stop <laughs> <laughs> because I love talking about these stories 
And as scientists, we don't get to really write about these stories, right? Because these are rare observations, mm -hmm. there's speculations, you, you can't really talk about exactly what was going on in their minds. Nevertheless, th those are our experiences as well. Um, I would, well, as Shika was mentioning uh, the the magical moment of being accepted in another primate group, you no, know? yes, and that, and I would share two stories if that's all right, uh, because one is a positive one, one is maybe not so positive, uh, yeah. but both are related to being accepted in a group. Um, well, unlike the lion-tailed macaques, as uh, Shika said, the bonnet males were quite reluctant, the adult males quite reluctant to the presence it was not like they were um unaccepting but they were just indifferent most of them so this was a particular troop it was a multi-male multi-female troop um and they have been so rana and kakuri have been uh, studying them for for years and i was just looking at the gestural communication of this particular troop the um, alpha male was, as I said, very indifferent, and it was almost after a year, he was still indifferent. And, you know, that kind of bothered me. <laughs> While we always want to remain objective, we also have this tendency of getting little signs that they like us. I'm, I'm being very honest here. And that is a very subjective understanding, but we do feel like, oh, do they like us? Do they, are they following us also? Are they noticing us? So it bothered me that the entire other, the other members, the juveniles were always very curious about me. The females sometimes would come and sit next to me like I was either did not exist or a part of the group. I don't know which one, but the other alpha male would always avoid eye contact, will move away, etc. So one afternoon, it was very hot. The whole troop was either up on the trees, there was a huge ficus tree there, either up there or underneath uh, the bushes. And I was following, I was under the bushes following one particular focal uh, female. And suddenly I heard a very loud lip smacking, you know, the, the greeting behavior, but they also have a copulatory lip smacking, which makes a lot of noise. So it's, it's like an auditory gesture. I looked around, I saw the alpha male was sitting not too far from me and actually giving me a copulatory lip smacking, which wow. made my heart leap. <laughs> oh my God. It's not only acceptance, but it's like a proposition. <laughs> and I was happy, but I didn't want to interact. So I looked away. I was looking at my focal, but he kept on doing it. And he came and sat in front of me so that I could see him. Side story. This told me that lip smacking is not a reflexive behavior, but it's actually a gesture because he wanted my attention and his intention was to show me this gesture. He kept on doing it and finally I had to look at him. And this was the time when the other troop members were descending down. The other females and the alpha female descended down. Trust me, he ran like a bullet. It was like, I was not looking at her. I was not looking at her. I'm, I'm being loyal to the <laughs> And he ran like a bullet. He never looked back at me. And it was like a little secret rendezvous that we had. And immediately as the troop arrived, he was like, he does not know me at all. So it was kind of a special moment, but also, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I felt about it, but it was very interesting. I don't even know. I, I'm, I'm not in a position to go and say that, well, it, he was being deceptive to the troop members. I don't know. But it was an amazing experience thinking that, OK, after a year, not only the whole troop, but even the alpha male um, has accepted me. On the other hand, there was another troop which was a unimale multi-female. You know that in Bonnet Macaques, this is a new social organization that has been um, observed uh, by Rana's uh, group. Um, and it is known that the alpha males, or the only adult male of the group, is more aggressive than the than the um, multi-male, multi-female troop uh, alphas. And this was a new troop that I found. So they had not been habituated to researchers. So that took a long time. And then when I arrived at a point that, okay, fine, I can now finally start taking some focals. The adult male was never very happy with me. He would find opportunities to chase me away, literally chase me away. So during this time, <laughs> I was one day walking along a pond and the troop was also walking with me. I was taking my observations. 
And the alpha male was quite far away. And suddenly he started approaching me quite intentionally. Like he was looking at me straight, approaching me, very relaxed, with no hurry, no ap ap like apparent aggression, but very determined. And I, tr I started moving backwards, not looking at him, not looking at anywhere else because I had my eyes on the focal. As I said, there was a pond behind. Thankfully, it was the dry season, so there was not much water. <laughs> I fell. I had to save my expensive binoculars and my notebook in two hands. So I was literally uh, having a free fall. My field assistant was shouting, Madam Yenaita, Madam Yenaita. Well, I, I couldn't do anything. I fell. And when I was at the bottom of the pond, trust me, I looked up and the bonnet adult male was on the side of the dike. He was looking over the dike to see whether I had fallen or not. He made sure I was down at the at the bottom of the pond and then he left with the troop. Again, I'm not in a position to attribute any any intentionality here, but it seemed like if he could, you know, do a slow clap, he would be like, you deserve it. <laughs> so it was on one hand the happy moment of being accepted in a group, on the other, very clear indication that we don't want you here. You you are an outsider. So, yeah. Well. All these, all these stories are bringing back so many memories. I don't want to go into all of them, but <laughs> as, as Shika, I mean, long story short, as Shika was mentioning, it's, it was fascinating how very gradually you become a part of, definitely not a part of the group because you're not a monkey. You, you don't have the same behaviors, but what emerged in between was an interspecies communication. And since I studied communication, um, I had a particular focus on this that, well, there is a communication going on between a monkey species, which had been known, well, not really considered as, um, let me rephrase, sorry. Uh, for apes, um, it's not such a, such a surprise when there is a communication being established between humans and, and apes because we are so close in phylogeny that, that it is kind of taken for granted that yes we will have these commonalities but when this was happening with the monkey species you see that there are still so much that we share um in the in the basic uh, communication uh, sphere that was fascinating that um that um, realization yeah Wow, I think what you've also shared with us brings out so many layers of um, what we're starting to talk about more in primatology now, which is all these individual variations and the personalities of different macaques in a particular group. And uh, I think this is probably something that primatologists have been observing for ages, for decades. And because we're always forced to think so objectively, we're forced to just kind of shove those aside, never really talk about it or write about it. But it's really exciting to hear some of these stories um, and to know more about it now. Um, but I'm also glad you brought up apes, Shijata, because you've also had the chance to do some work with chimps and in that arena. So how different or similar was that experience for you when it in terms of working with bonnet macaques versus working with chimpanzees and um and yeah i know this is an unfair question but do you have a preference <laughs> um well Comparing the experiences, it was completely different because <clears throat> bonnet macaques, I observed them in their natural habitat uh, and in their uh, in the wild in during their spontaneous uh, communication interactions. Chimps, I did the work in captivity. So I worked at the Edinburgh Zoo. Uh, there are 16 uh, chimpanzees there um, and I did experimental work. So I trained them for touchscreen experiments, uh, which was a very tedious work because these chimps were very, very happy. They were the experimental. Yeah, it was one of the policies of the zoo that every experimental work has to be voluntary on part of the chimps. If they wanted to work, they would. If not, you just sit there for three hours in a day, no data. Right. Uh, so that way it was a very dif different experience. On the other hand, um, I had more freedom to interact with uh, with the species. 
um, for the bonnet macaques, the the main goal was not to interact with them so that I don't um, influence their behavior. Here, I had to I had to teach them no no touch here no no touch there. Um, but I also used to do some observational uh, observational work in captivity. Uh, so if I have to compare the gestural repertoire of of the monkey species versus an ape. Um, Apes use a lot of their hands, right? Because, well, they don't really have an upright stance, but they sit like humans. Monkeys don't always sit like that, which is why their hands are more free than the monkeys have, which is why they use a lot of manual gestures, which gives them a lot of opportunity of doing many other kinds of gestures. So, um, and then <clears throat> as you were talking about individual uh individual strategies and personalities that was very well it was very stark in the monkeys also uh but it came across as more stark for the apes to me maybe because i was directly interacting with them uh and actually communicating with them um so for example there were some of them who would only work for grapes and if if so they would first come sit on the other side in front of the screen and they would actually peep and look what rewards I have. If it was only apples that I had in front of me, they will just leave. And then I'll have to be like, no, 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 here, you see, I have grapes too. I have grapes for you. Come, come, come back, come back. <laughs> and then they would look and they would be like, okay, fine. You know your game. And then they will come and sit down. Others, there were some who were not. Um, so for example, if they finished the entire uh, experiment and and they will be like babies, you know, no, I want to work and be like, no, you are done. You can have some juice there, but they will sit and, and do like tantrums, like babies in front of the. So those were the those were the experiences that, that I had with the with the chimps, um, which I never it was not part of my work either with the with the monkeys. Um, and <laughs> I will not answer the question of preference at all. I will not go into controversial fields. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I don't have any preference. I also in between worked a little bit with uh, lemurs uh, in captivity at the Duke Lima Center, uh, where I also had a lot of opportunity to not directly interact with them, but they would rather come and interact with me because it was a semi, um, semi-natural environment that was created for them. And I would observe them there and they were very curious. I never knew that lemurs were so interactive and so curious. So, and they were very cute. They were very cute. They didn't do much in, in terms of gestures, of course. They, they don't do any gestures as far as I uh, observed. But they were very cute, very fluffy, very sweet to be around. And um, so that way, I don't have any preference. And I now work with infants. Uh, so it's a very tricky question. Yeah, sorry. That's... I think I lost the connection a little bit. So it's a very tricky question. I love working with all of them. And one day in the near future, I would like to go back to working with non-human primates, which might have a hint there in your in, for, for, for my answer. But uh, my research has always <laughs> been guided by the questions that emerge through my present research. So therefore, I, I choose my model system according to the questions that emerge and makes a nice story overall. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think that's very fair. It's uh, I don't think I would be able to choose if I had worked with such uh, entirely different groups of primates. I um, but thanks for that and also for those uh, for those stories. I think it just throws up so many questions about again agency in primates and intentionality and why they do the things they do. Um, so I think this is also one of those things where the longer we spend with them and in their presence, the more questions we have than answers. And um, I think that's clearly something that all three of us resonate with quite a bit. Um, it's good because we, that's why we still have jobs. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> 
Shikha, what about, uh, tell us a bit more about the lion tail macaques. Um, is there any particular behavior, even though this, this is the one species you've spent all your time working with and you, it was instant love and you refused to work with any other species, but uh, is there something about them that makes them uniquely lion tail macaques, which is quite different from the other primates that you've observed in your life, even if not for work? Okay, small correction before I start. I did not say that I will not go to India. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit answer your previous question as well. There are different levels of favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, favorites maybe which we want to like observe in the field or favorites we might like want to at some point work in the future with. Uh, so that's definitely there. Um, if, uh, what makes lion tail work out is different for me. Uh, it's a different thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, I... Um, it's more like the experiences of working with them and uh, like observing them closely have made me more attached to the species probably because I have a lot of experiences with them, a lot of field observations that I have and uh, keep close to me either like uh, personally or even for my academic purposes as well. So um, I am biased towards that and that uh, what makes them different, I can... Um, uh, Maybe like few things probably is like when I'm observing them in the field, one of the species that I closely observe is also mainly langos which share the spaces with them, right? These are two species and I see drastic differences in the way each of them behave and uh, I feel like, okay, Nilgiri Lango is a little bit more tough to like follow since I'm looking at movement behavior and it's very crucial for me to like uh, be able to like follow the true through their day from morning till evening when they stop. So for that purpose, I think it's difficult to like probably like follow Nilgiri Langurs and I'm, I always respect someone who has like habituated and follow Nilgiri Langurs because they are also so, so fast and uh, probably like quick to respond when they see someone coming. I haven't tried habituating the troop, but um, even though it's a troop which uh, is in my way that I, that I cross probably like every day they're still like hesitant of my presence and they jump like crashing through the forest it's very different from how lion tail macaques are uh, lion tail macaques i feel are, are more gentle when they're moving most of the time um the way they hold the branch or they even like jump from one branch to the other uh, and how they sit even is very different from the langurs in general also uh, and probably one thing that I'm very uh, attracted to or like I always like like look forward to is hearing the vocalization of the troop, a langur, uh, sorry, a lantel macaque call. So they also have like contact calls, uh, subtle coo calls sometimes, a coo call which uh, they give. So what I've seen is there are two kinds uh, from my observations. Uh, so one is a, when the troop is moving in search of like food through the forest through the day. Uh, sometimes if it's a larger or a smaller troop, maybe there are subgrouping or temporary splitting where uh, true groups sort of like one group will go in the front and one group will lag behind a little bit. And they have this contact call to keep the one in the front uh, updated of where they are probably and to let them know that, okay, we are still around. And that's one thing that I've seen. But my favorite one would be um, when they are resting, the troop is sort of like little spread around, uh, probably like post 12, around noonish time when they're a little lazy, they want to chill, they're like full from all the fruits that they have eaten in the morning. So they're just like resting a little bit. The troop is a little bit spread uh, during that time. And um, even the younger ones would give like a low coo, -coo, -coo call. Um, it's, it's not uh, very loud. I mean, the macaque calls are also not as loud compared to a lot of other species. So this one, especially the lower coo call is uh, very subtle. And uh, in that forest, in that ambience, it's sort of like um, what I connect to is sort of, it's, it's a reassurance call that every, like the individuals are giving to the other individuals that everyone's here and they haven't started moving. So that call is sort of like very interesting for me. And it's, a, it's something that I look forward to when I'm working with them or just spending my days with them around that noon time. It is also a reassurance for me that the troop is still there because during that noon time, it's there are higher chances that you will miss the troop. 
they would move very slowly and it's very easy to miss them because they would most of the time they would be in the upper canopy and uh, because of the vegetation a lot of times you won't be able to like follow each of the individuals and see them very clearly so these are sometimes it's not, i would be able to like see the individuals it's just the movement of the branches and i'm trying to like make out okay this is a real team that is moving and i should start moving so this call ku call is again a reassurance for me as well that the troop is around and i can also chill for a bit until they start moving again so these kind of things are there which yeah makes me feel a little bit closer and more wanting to like work online in macaques and looking forward to watching them looking forward to like being in field to like see the troop again next year from me yeah no that's lovely i think the longer you spend in the field it sounds like you're just so in sync with the individuals and exactly what they're up to and in what i was also thinking even earlier when you were talking about habituation where even before you start collecting data you're just spending so much time doing nothing but your observations and you're getting to know them and they're getting to know you and there's also that phase where they start to also be, their, their patterns become slightly more predictable and you can kind of try and guess what their plan is for the day and you know what's going to happen and i'm guessing you're probably a lot more in sync with that since you're actively looking at their movement ecology um so i think that's that's really uh, very cool shika very fascinating yeah very true just like shida shrijata was saying it's a thriller story sometimes sometimes you have you spend nights thinking where would they be next day because it's yeah. very important for me to like find them early next day before they move ahead uh, otherwise you spend a lot of time searching for the troop and spend maybe like entire first half of the morning or the entire day just locating the troop so it's sort of like a guesswork murder mystery that keeps on going so that day yeah <laughs> If I if I may just interject here a little bit, taking from what Shika was talking about, how when you uh, when you get familiarized with the communication patterns within the group and you also extract information from them to your benefit, I think when we were talking previously about uh, our magical magic moments uh, in primatology, I think this this would come very high on 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 top of the list that when you can. So from a distance, if you see the silhouette of a macaque and you know the individual and then initially you are in a bit of doubt and then when they come closer and it you are right, that is the mo- eureka moment that, oh my God, I know them all, not only by their faces, but just by the, by the way they sit or the way they walk. And when Rana actually initially told me that, oh, you know, it'll be fine, you will know them all. and from a distance even up on the trees you will know which individual it is i didn't i didn't trust him it's like no it, it's not possible it's like one, 150 macaques for four troops i won't be able to do it but when i started getting familiarized with individuals this way it was a fascinating experience it was like right i'm on the right track and s- comparing it with the chimps um they're easier to identify that way because firstly it was one troop it was uh, in the captivity it was um, few individuals and they were all very different looking different body shapes so even even from a distance you would know exactly who is sitting where but from their calls so sometimes i would be in my office and i would just hear that there is a commotion going on and who is giving which call and i'd be like oh these two guys are fighting and then i would run to the enclosure and i would see that exactly those two guys were fighting and from their calls if i could identify them that would be like my my day is done i'm not going to work anymore i'm just going to go and chill and treat myself <laughs> um even even with gestures yeah so that that i i was i was uh, i was having goosebumps when you said that yeah with the cool calls i knew that they were around and yeah it was really i i miss the field days more now thinking about it <laughs> Oh, these are just such special moments really um i also realized that i have uh, many questions left of course because we can keep talking about these things but we have already been talking for about 15 minutes now so i'm going to take this uh, moment to just remind everyone who's here on the webinar if you'd like to ask shrijita or shikha any questions or if you'd like to share anything the chat box is open so uh do send in your questions and while you do that um i'm going to switch topics a little bit and ask you guys what you think about 
the popular discourse in primatology now where a lot of people are looking at the differences between how men primatologists are in the field and how women primatologists are in the field and i'm really not one for binaries in any way but if you were to look at that popular discourse where people feel that perhaps women do a better job at observing primates um what where do you stand on that and what do you think uh is the reality is it is it a gender thing or is it something completely different shikha do you want to go first uh not very sure because i i what i feel is that um, traditionally like women have been at that attributed with particular characteristics of like being more observational or nurturing probably uh but i feel the gender difference doesn't uh I mean it it's not that stark because I've, like in my field my field collaborators or the interns probably that i've had are also like males and they were also like equally uh, observant and probably were able to like uh, differentiate between individuals or uh, uh, understand minute observe minute behavior and observations as well uh, so uh, there is a gender imbalance of course in probably like every field um like it, it's not particular to primatology as well but i'm happy there are more prim- like women primatologists around me to like share my experiences because of course the experiences in field of uh, female primatologist versus a male probably just as binaries as of now is very different so it's nice to like share these observations share the experiences that you have uh but yeah i'm not very sure if it's uh yeah yeah what about you say jata well okay it's a complicated question and i i hope i do justice to 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 it with my responses because it doesn't come from any theories or theoretical understanding but just my personal experiences i think the discourse that you are referring to kind of emerged as the number of women primatologists in my, like started increasing and it's true that there are more and more apparently i mean there was also some papers that came out that oh primatology is one of the most um egalitarian fields uh, in in academia at the moment because there are about 57% primatologists who are women while it was criticized when the professors of primatology were looked at they were all males well um and the the all the primatological societies are headed mostly by males so yeah there 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 was a debate that that was created but what you are particularly referring to is whether women are better observers as primatologists than others i think there are certain historical reasons to come to that conclusion but it probably is not that straightforward and is not so the it's a correlation and not a causation um and if you allow me i could just say a few things why i think that this kind of it, it, this is a stereotype is what i feel already um because well number one there are these pioneers in primatology who were all three of them were women we know right therefore they definitely set um an example for all women to think that okay if i want to pursue this i can and uh, that has been the case for many uh, primatologists who finally became primatologists for this inspiration on the other hand my understanding is that this was a fallout of another social stereotype that you're a girl when when they are younger okay you are a woman you want to do science go for the softer sciences what are the softer sciences biology is a soft science psychology is a soft science and you go for that and this is not only particularly for india huh? it's it's everywhere and it has been written about quite a lot um so you go for it and then from there what do you do oh primatology is a field of study that i can do either if i'm um if i'm a psychologist or a biologist and it was rather sometimes not by choice but by design that women came into primatology 
On the other hand, as Shika uh, briefly uh, touched uh, on this, because of the social stereotypy of women are in all women are inherently they have the mother instinct that is omnipresent in all women equally they will be better at handling or looking at or understanding primate behavior which are fluffy nice little cute animals you know and women like fluffy nice cute animals this is another social stereotypy which inspired or encouraged them to go towards this while anyone who has seen a primate fight be it a monkey fight or a chimpanzee fight they would know they are nothing close to cute or fluffy or nice to be cuddled right but these are certain social stereotypes that led women to go or encourage them or women students were told that hey this is an opportunity for you because you're a woman right on the other hand the debate about whether they are better observers or better interpreters of behaviors or not also has a traditional histo historicity to it for for example in the 70s gene altman first gave us the systematic behavioral methodology not only to study primate behavior but any uh, any animal behavior but because she was also a primatologist it was um, um employed in primate behavior studies before that it was more of an opportunistic observations by women men alike what happened is the species that they were studying the males were more dominant and they had very extravagant displays and aggressive behavior so those were opportunistically more visible while on the other hand the female behaviors were subtle they were doing very complex stuff they were subtle and those were overlooked this probably was not so much influenced by social stereotypy and gender roles but the start using more objective methodologies sorry i think i lost there a little bit the connection yes. uh, i was saying when we started using more objective uh, uh, methodology it was equal equal focus was given on all individuals and more and more different types of behavior started coming to our understanding to our knowledge we saw that okay females and males might have different roles in a primate social group but they were of these kinds they were of these natures and they were functioning in this way on top of that yes when when more women primatology started coming to the field given by their personal political agendas many of them for example sarah hardy uh, who is a self-proclaimed feminist given their personal politics their, their their interests of question like questions of interest may have been influenced by that personal subjective agenda i'm not saying their science was influenced by the subjective agenda but their choice of questions what exact which behavior exactly would they study was influenced and thankfully so that they focused more on female strategies female behaviors and it is still going on there was last year i reviewed a paper from a japanese primatology group where they looked only at female behavior in mate choice on the other hand it was known for and, and accepted forever that it was only the males in a primate group that were driving the mate choice right so this is still going on more and more work needs to be done in this area Overall, what I think is it has nothing to do with the field of primatology, as Shika was mentioning. It is a reflection of what social stereotypy exists in our societies. And more or less in every society, what exists is are these strong gender roles, gender bias roles. And we are knowingly or unknowingly somewhat influenced by them anyway. We try to, in our adult lives, given our levels of awareness, we try to get rid of them, we try to be more aware, and we try to actively not let them influence our work or our interpretations. But if we have been raised in this society, indirectly or directly, we have gone through 
these gender roles or if we are not practicing them in our own lives we have seen them around so it's it's no wonder that we will be influenced by this not only in the field of chronology but in others what we can do is start uh, start um dialogues like this that you have started and make ourselves more aware and revisit our interpretations to see whether it's an influence of any kind of social stereotypy that we are bearing within us or is it actually emerging from the systematic observations that that we have at hand so overall i don't think that one is a better observer than others irrespective of gender there are some better observers than others that i firmly believe there are some people who are more adept at observing or noticing subtle behaviors than others this i'm without any any disrespect to anyone this i have noticed uh, working with a lot of professors uh, master students that i have trained or uh, phd students that i have guided yes some are better observers than others but that has nothing to do with their gender thanks for that shijata i think uh, sorry it was a very yeah. very long answer i'm sorry no no please don't be sorry because i think this is it was a loaded question and there is so many uh we are of course hypothesizing what the reasons for this can be and like you're saying there can be manifold it can be historical it can be the social structures within which we are currently situated and it's also the fact that the kinds of people who have set up the scientific systems in which we work and we continue to work um have also had skewed gender ratios over time so um but i do agree with both of you i think we think about it a lot more in the primatology lens because uh, like you were saying there was jane goodall there was dan fossey there's bayrute galticas but uh, and that makes us think through that more woman lens but it is probably something that's very true for many different fields and especially the niches in wildlife conservation which tends to be quite um, can also be a macho field sometimes of course yeah go ahead and if i can add a little bit to that um i think yes in some some situations not only primatology in any social situation we come across and it becomes a part of our database that yes women are more attentive to others maybe they are more empathetic women are keener observers maybe it's in their genes but i think also women are brought up to be like that in our society yeah nature or nurture from, from a very very uh, young age girl infants are brought up to be and in the indian society this is particularly true that men boys are brought up to be like you study you get a job you provide for the family if not even directly in very even so called liberal families i have seen that this is subtly put put into the psyche of of the children but for women for for the girls it's more like yeah 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 you do a lot of things you be part of the social gatherings you go to family reunions you but it's not so so um stressed for for boys so i think it's a very layered and multifaceted thing that when even when we are observing things that point towards the fact that there are these gender differences in these capacities we should revisit the underlying mechanisms whether it is really biological therefore whether we can look at evolutionary um shared capacities in other species or it is purely cultural that is facilitating this difference sorry wow. no i find myself agreeing with absolutely everything you said <laughs> um, <laughs> um so it doesn't seem like there's uh, any questions coming in from the audience but i do see some familiar names and i know that this is generally an audience of a bunch of aspiring primatologists so um i think my i'm going to wrap up our webinar by just asking both of you what do you think the current gaps in our knowledge of primates today are i know this is again another really big question but where do you think some of the biggest gaps in the studies of primates and in primatology in general currently are we can focus uh, on india just you know for practical sakes um and what do you think we should be doing and studying what kind of projects do we need to really prioritize in the years to come shikha would you like to go first 
start. Um, again, this is uh, quite a large topic for discussion, I guess. Uh, but within India, I feel like there are um, traditional methods which are still being followed or studies which are uh, done repeatedly in different landscapes rather than exploring the opportunities um, highly. So uh, there needs to be a little bit more diversity in there and adapt a lot that is being done probably in other universities internationally as well. We're still like sub, uh, somewhat sticking to the old methodologies a little bit or using uh, just the traditional uh, techniques probably. And or there is also a tendency to like stick to a one area or one group because it's already been habituated. So the studies are continuously happening. I mean, there is importance for long term studies, but still there are a lot of populations and we are increasingly finding that there is a lot of variations between individuals, between populations as well. So there is the need to like explore and expand the study systems and study areas as well, um, rather than sticking to one population and understanding the variations over there just the variations we need to like understand what is happening through probably the entire geographical space um and probably this is a issue for funding because there is also uh there is also a tendency to study or look at only species it's i mean i understand that a lot of people here as well are interested in diverse species but there is a limitation because of the funding or the logistic issues or opportunities that are out there. So that is again a limitation which needs to be explored and uh, diversified. But one thing I would one advise probably um, in my experience I would also give is to read up a little bit more but not I mean, even from what the discussion today was. We did romanticize a lot about by sharing our positive experiences, right? There are also like negative experiences definitely there. Even the discussion about male versus female, there are a lot of physical and mental challenges as well while you are going to field. It's not always that the troop is there and you just go there and watch them. There is a lot of physical challenges involved while we, you are like navigating that spaces and, uh, like, and trying to like understand your species. So it would be like also better to like get and get hands on, not hands on, but yeah, like experience with in field on ground with the species and observe them so that you also know exactly where you, which aspect of the species you would like to like study and explore. Uh, Shrijada was also talking about a lot of the captive ex captive species experience that she had. That is a lot to explore as well. And even in the forest species or the rural areas, there are a lot of aspects that need to be explored. But one main thing is also to like move away from just the traditional methods and techniques that are using that are used here. Um, there are a lot of issues with getting permits to use different equipments or techniques. But unless we start exploring in that area that's never going to happen right so rather than sticking to what is convenient we need to like push a little bit ahead and uh, see how the new evolving techniques and technologies can be like adapted towards in the current system or how to explore that thanks shika yeah i do agree i think there's not just in terms of species and topics but even in terms of the methods we're using clearly there's a lot more um, that can be done. Uh, yeah, it was a general even... answer, but yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. And um, I think I wish we had a little more time to delve into some of those challenges that you mentioned as well, because of course, each one of these fields uh, has pros and cons and there's a lot of challenges and there are days, the good days and bad days. And it's some of the positive romanticized uh, stories that we shared today that keeps us going, no doubt, uh, even in the midst of not so good days. Um but thanks for uh, thanks for that answer, uh, Shrijata. What do you think? No, I absolutely agree with whatever Shika was saying, um, and uh, uh, the methodology part was spot on. Because, and I would like to add a little bit on that. Um, again, it builds on the historicity uh, in, in in India. The animal studies and animal behavior studies kind of emerge from an age old tradition of naturalistic observations right we are we love we are very good naturalists we have everything around us we observe we write down we have hobbies of bird watching and from those hobbies we come into the scientific field of 
animal behavior or conservation, right? We also have a very rich history of conservation science, which is an applied field of science, which is an applied field of animal behavior and human animal interactions that you're seeing, which you apply to make um, things better for the animals, for the environment, etc. However, I find in having worked in India and having worked with students in India, I find that there is a very blurred line between this initial stage of being a naturalist and falling in love with nature and falling in love with the model species that I'm going to study. We all talked about today how we fell in love with macaques or other primate species and started working. There is the and a scientific pursuit of studying that species. This line is very blurred, <clears throat> sorry, in the approach that we have in animal studies in India. This is my personal understanding because the scientific studies we are we are doing it's not hypotheses based right we still i even i did it even i did my phd like this i went out i had this theory that maybe this species uh, also does gestural communication because at that point of time we knew only apes do it monkeys don't but that was it right that was my large hypothesis but it was not i didn't have questions i didn't have particular questions to follow it emerged however science is not done that way right that is the that is the first step that is pilot that we can do but when we are starting a project we have to have hypotheses and based on that we have to have questions and that might change over two years, three years of, of studies or over a long-term study, new hypotheses might emerge from the observations. But this line is very blurred, which sometimes makes us feel at the end of a project that, oh, if only I knew about this, I could have, you know, thought about systematically doing some observations on this particular thing. So that way we are missing out on, and that is that is a key area I think we can improve. It's not only in India, I just gave the example of India because I had experience working here, but I think there are other places where it still is followed like this. The other thing that Shika mentioned about um, captive studies, captivity studies, uh, it's not always bad. We have this tendency to think that, oh my God, zoos are bad for animals. I will never study there. I had that kind of feeling. But then I realized that there are, for example, this group of chimps I talked about, they would not survive a day in the wild because they were all rescued chimps. They were rescued from circuses or from, um, you know, pet trade and this kind of things. They will not exist a day. They had a good life in the zoo. And when I started working with them, I realized that there are some questions which have to be addressed from an experimental design point of view if we have to um, test our hypotheses. Again, hypothesis is driven. Observational studies give us new hypotheses which have to be tested through experiments. Therefore, captive, captive studies are important, especially for my field in cognitive science, in, in comparative cognition. We have to take control variables because it's already such a complex thing. And in India, it is lacking at the moment, right, as Shikha was mentioning. And I don't think that that can be changed from individual um, efforts. It has to be an institutional effort. It has to be a central effort. The need for these kind of studies have to be taken up by larger bodies who have more power to provide us with this infrastructure. It's not possible that you have a two-year postdoc project or a five-year PhD project where you establish an infrastructure for captive studies. It is not possible. So that needs to be addressed. Um, and the final thing I wanted to talk about, because it's, it's a broad question, right? It's like what is missing in primatology because the field itself is so diverse. What do you mean by my, like Shika studies um, movement uh, behavior. I study comparative psychology. We Maybe there are overlaps in, you study human primate um, interactions and conflict. Maybe we are using some, there are overlaps in some of our methodologies, but our questions are diverse. Our approaches are diverse. Our um, literature that we read is diverse so uh, there is no one way to say what is missing but one overarching thing that bothers me at times again because I study communication and cognition this comparison comes very often 
and because primates are so closely related to us, the, <laughs> the sword of anthropomorphizing. We are all aware of it. We are all, when we are doing observations, we are trying to avoid that. But you know, deep down, we are coming to approach, we are approaching these questions, we are attempting to find answers to questions, for example, like what is the, what is gestural communication in monkeys like? Deep down, the question is, why are humans special? Humans have language. I'm doing this to show the differences. Why are they special? We need to change that. Or we see a behavior like, say, grief. All human societies have grief. And then we just take this whole big thing of grief and then try to look at other species, other primates. And we just come back and say that they, they don't grief. That is very particularly human. But then we are not distinguishing between the biological facets of grief versus the cultural facets of grief. And we are not making this distinction that the cultural aspects are uniquely unique to human evolutionary history, while the biological facets can be studied in a, from an evolutionary framework. These two aspects bother me so much because I think they are driven by this underlying agenda to show that no matter what, humans are a bit special. We love primates. We see how, how complex their behavior is, how complex their social interactions are, but still we want to distinguish ourselves as a special species. This, I think, has to be addressed for future, yeah, whichever, whichever, whatever we study for, for the primates. Thanks, Shijata. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting to see the philosophical shift in the field that is coming uh, with the younger generations of primatologists now. Um, and you also mentioned Jean Altman, who put together those basic traditional methods that everyone's used for decades. And um, it's also interesting to see what philosophies are leading us maybe away from that or finding ways to integrate that into other methods to address some of these gaps. And hopefully those who are listening here um, will also think about these things a little more deeply following this conversation. Um, as we were talking, there were a couple of questions that came in, but we are very short on time. So I'm going to pick one question each and maybe we can have some rapid answers for these before we um before we have to close for today but um before i bring that up uh, there were also some requests to do more such webinars to really delve into what those challenges are and what the state of the field of primatology is like in certain contexts so hopefully we'll have the opportunity to keep this conversation going even beyond today um we have one question for shikha um have you observed any idiosyncratic behavior in individuals in the groups of LPMs that you follow? Uh, so one of the challenge and one thing that I am always jealous of uh, others who are identifying the individuals or uh, doing uh, studies in probably like an open space is identification of individuals. Uh, for me, the system where I am, I'm working in the rainforest habitat and it's sometimes very difficult to identify each of the individuals separately. I am able to identify probably the adult male or female and especially if the females have like an infant uh, with it. So, um, or maybe probably if there is a very distinct scar or a mark, then I'm able to like identify that individual. Uh, so otherwise I'm not, I wasn't able to like pinpoint like each individual in my troop and see how the differences in the behavior are but probably there was one uh, instance where um, I was trying to like follow the alpha male uh, in my troop and I wasn't able to because uh, at that particular point the male was follow sort of like moving in the periphery away from the troop but I mean, not too far but not too close as well and it was also moving a little bit faster and since I was particularly like following that specific individual it was moving even away from me uh, like the troop was habituated but not really the individual but there was one uh, instance where um, the female in the troop came to heat and then suddenly the male 
started like coming much more closer and be interacting with the entire troop a lot more and uh, there were cooperatory behaviors as well and then again there was this uh, subdominant adult male probably of uh, similar physique and size and he would sometimes like try to like meet with this particular uh, female and there would be some clashes between these two adults where he would like uh, seek uh, opportunities where the the other dominant male was away from the troop or the female and would snatch those opportunities and try to like female just move from the corner Side and like do anything, and when the other um, yes, some individuals were more stressed than others which, because of their individual history. Some had gone through tra traumatizing past, some were very chilled because they had been raised in captivity. So that was home for them. Um, so we all know that they they scratch, they um, pull pull out their hair, which are typical signs of being stressed, or they pace up and down. Thankfully, at the Edinburgh Zoo, there was a lot of focus on and priority was on providing enrichment for not only the chimps but all the animals that lived on in the zoo. So we had very less of those kinds of typical behaviors. <laughs> However, there were individual variations and idiosyncratic variations nothing related to stress and there was i would just share one funny uh, funny one because so that this was a um adult male but a young adult male uh, who was very well natured he would he was in like the middle of the hierarchy so he showed many uh, fun strategies of how to keep everybody you know as his friend and he would fight during a fight he would fight a little bit for this group and then a little bit for, bit for that group but he never liked to touch the ground with his feet it was it was like an obsessive compulsive thing with Freck his name is Freck that he would not touch the ground and every time he would sit in his nest, he would keep rubbing his feet. His hands were fine, right? He was picking up things uh, from the ground with his hands. It was fine. But with his feet, he would always rub. But anyway, he had to walk on the, on the ground, right? So he found out a way of, he used to get two boxes. So they were given fruits and vegetables in cardboard boxes. So he would collect these two boxes. He would put them underneath neath his feet during foraging. And he would walk on the boxes, you know, uh, so that his, he, yeah, there was, there was no mud on his feet. That was a very, it was not only the idiosyncrasy of him not liking mud touching his feel, uh, feet, but also finding a solution, innovative solution, almost like finding shoes um, that he would do that. And even, even he didn't like to sit on the muddy part. He would like to sit on concrete. So whenever he had to sit on the mud or on the, on the grass, he would bring a box and he would just sit inside the box. <laughs> so this was very cute, but I think it was also linked to, sadly linked to his traumatizing childhood, which he spent in one of the labs in, in the Netherlands, a medical lab. But we don't know exactly why this this happened. But this didn't affect any of his behavioral interactions with the group members or about his any other behavior. He was otherwise a very happy, healthy chimp. Oh, that's just so so fascinating. Um, and I feel again at the end of the webinar, I have more questions than I had at the start. But this was just such a fantastic conversation. I think this is one of the most fun webinars I've had the opportunity to do. Um, and thank you both so much for just sharing uh, so many stories and for reminiscing with me and going down, um, yeah, memory lane to pull thank out. Thank you for organizing. Yeah. Thank you for organizing. Thank you for inviting. Actually, I had many questions for you, and I thought that because Northeast is, is it, it it holds a very special place in my heart. I started a little bit working in Northeast, so I thought that maybe I'll have the opportunity to ask you a little bit about that, which we couldn't today. So the next one maybe should be we ask you questions. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm I always to game to talk about the monkeys, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah more, more of these. Yeah. 
had so many opportunities to like talk to Ishika in office and in person about her work site. I think we missed out on the opportunity to hear a lot from her as well. Uh, <laughs> the next time. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I I just need to uh I just need an excuse to get you guys on another Zoom meeting and uh, yeah, I think this was just so much fun and thank you everybody for joining in and for sticking around an extra half an hour even though our conversation went on a little longer and I'm sure the three of us can easily keep going but um you do this forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much and this was really wonderful and uh, yeah for all those who have joined in keep an eye out for uh, future webinars and hopefully we can keep talking about primates in the months to come as well. <laughs> thank you Shikha also for sharing your stories it was fascinating. Thank you same here it was fascinating to listen to you as well. Uh, I, I think so many questions after this and probably we can catch up later. Absolutely, keep in touch. Happy to. Yeah, continue monkey conversations. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Take Chika. Care. Thank you. Have a have a good weekend. Enjoy your evening. You too. You too. Bye. Take care, everyone.